Welcome back to another video guys. Uh, you join me today inside the house in the warm uh, for an update video and that update video is very much uh, to try and give you a little bit of an update as to what's been going on. It's been ages since I've actually done a face-to-face -face, uh, or a vlog or anything like that and I know a lot of you have uh, messaged and checked to see if I'm still riding. Um, I've had a few people reach out on Instagram uh, just to see if I'm okay, which is really, really nice. Um, I'm going to start the video off by just saying thank you. Massive, massive thank you. There's loads of you who have subscribed now. I find it so hard to believe that 750-odd people um, want to listen to me, but there we go. Um, so it is uh, wonderful that so many people are here, and um, I don't take it for granted. I, I'm very, very grateful to each and every one of you that are subscribed. Uh, it's encouraged me to make this video, and it's encouraging me to carry on making videos about different stuff that I come across to do with bikes or the journey that I've gone on uh, about learning to ride. Um, so this video has a few different parts. Uh, I want to give you an update as to what's been going on, uh, an update on my riding and what's going on there, um, and then a uh, bit of a plan of what's going on over the next 12 months or so. Um, so first of all, last time that I actually spoke, uh, I don't think uh, I'd got uh, any real further into looking at doing my full license or anything like that. So let's cast our minds back to December 2020. And in December 2020, I'd had a few full bike lessons on a big bike and I decided that I was ready to take my Mod 1 uh, test. And I took my Mod 1 test and all was going absolutely swimmingly. Uh, for those of you that aren't sure about how the tests work, basically Mod 1 is like the off-road test. Um, and by off-road I mean like not on public roads, not as in bombing through a forest. Um, but basically it's slow maneuvers on a bike largely. So slaloms, figures of eights, um, U-turns, uh, slow riding uh, to simulate traffic basically to check that you have control of the vehicle uh, as you go through. So um, it lasts about half an hour-ish, uh, something like that. Uh, lots and lots of different things that you have to do, uh, all of which you can practice quite comfortably even on a smaller bike. Um, so went and did that and, uh, and had a, uh, a nice little a uh, few lessons on that and felt confident and I'd been doing all of the uh, things that I needed to do. Got there on the day, uh, absolutely torrential rain, uh, very nervous, uh, didn't want to fail it um, despite the fact it only cost him £15. Uh, it was obviously the bike hire and the tuition and all that sort of stuff and just didn't want to fail it. So anyway, uh, went mostly well. Um, and then I got to the U-turn and for whatever reason uh, I put my foot down. It's a really really easy mistake to make and I'd done over five practice U-turns in the hour before the test because it was the one that I was worried about and for whatever reason I put my foot down because I looked at the clocks on the bike instead of looking where I wanted to go and it's something that I give advice to all the people that I speak to whenever they're new riders, look where you wanna go. And in the heat of the moment, I looked exactly where I wasn't going. I looked where I was and uh, yeah, it makes you put your foot down basically because you lose balance and then you are really at the mercy of, you either put your foot down or you fall on the side of the bike. So I did what you would do in real life. I put my foot down to stop myself falling on the floor. Obviously it's an instant fail on mod one if you put a foot down. Um, so that wasn't good, but uh, the the examiner was really good. He let me carry on so I could have the experience of the whole thing because other than that, I hadn't really put a foot wrong, no pun intended. And uh, yeah, I was absolutely fine through the rest of it. The uh, last two exercises are an emergency stop and a swerve avoidance where you have to uh, accelerate up to a minimum of 50 kph, so it's about 32 miles an hour, uh, and then basically come to a controlled stop uh, in an emergency situation, so as fast as you can basically. And then the swerve avoidance is either a swerve to the right or a swerve to the left, making sure you don't clip the cones. And on both of those, I was absolutely fine as well. So yeah, one of those things. Uh, small mistake, made me fail it. Uh, three days later, resat it, passed it. No minors. Um, smashed the speed tests in fact. Um, I think I did uh, 62, no sorry, 74 kph for the emergency stop. 
so well above what it needed to be. It was about 42 mile an hour or something, I think. And uh, then for the swerve avoidance, I lowered it down to about 64, but I was still way faster than I need to be, uh, but still managed to stop. And that tarmac, I'll tell you now, if you're doing your mod one and you're worried, the tarmac on the, on the test centers is so grippy it was unreal like even in the rain there was no slippage like unless it's icy you're never going to slide on that it's so fat it's so unbelievably good it's the best tarmac you'll ever ride your bike on to be honest in the uk like even a new road isn't that grippy <laughs> so uh yeah really really good um bit disconcerting the test center that i tested at in wolverhampton you do ride towards the fence so it's a bit weird um because you, you feel like you're going towards something that you shouldn't be riding at. So that that sometimes practicing that can be a bit difficult. But the training center that I used, um, it was very tight with walls like that went either side of the of the test pad. So you got used to that feeling of something being sort of like right next to you. And that was quite good. So yeah, mod one sorted. Jolly good. Christmas Eve of 2020, all done. Mod two should have been about a fortnight later. And unfortunately, in January, we went into lockdown too. So that didn't happen. Um, and because of that, I was on my YS125. I kept going to work and uh, as I was a key worker and just kept practicing my skills really, but feeling frustrated that I couldn't get on a bigger bike, even though I felt ready. Um, but yeah, nothing I could do. So basically, uh, I managed to get a cancellation of a Mod 2 in about mid-May, it was the 21st of May as it happens, um, and uh, yeah, went out uh, again, pouring rain, I don't know what it is about me and Tess in the rain, but anyway, pouring rain, uh, went out, um, examiner was really, really good, same examiner that I had for Mod 1, um, seemed to have built up, I'm not going to say a relationship, but a rapport with him at least, and uh, yeah, he was fair, uh, he was clear, consistent, I was a bit worried about the show me, tell me questions, because like trying to remember the things they could ask, but to be honest, they were really obvious. Like, show me how you'd check the operation of the front brakes. Show me how you would um, test the horn. Uh, what changes would you make if you were gonna carry a pillion? So all the stuff that's listed on the website, and I'll put a link in the description, but there's a, there's a massive load of, of questions they could ask. There's about 28 questions, I think, but basically it's pretty much common sense. Like if you can't work that out, then yeah you really it's it's basics of riding so yeah um did that um one minor uh which was positioning um and that was where i went through a slightly narrowed bit of road uh where there was parked cars on one side uh, a bus coming towards me i positioned myself closer to the bus than the parked cars because i could see the bus and the bus was in his lane and i didn't think there was a risk of him coming over the parked cars, however, they could, somebody could have thrown a door open, whatever. So anyway, it was a minor in terms of um, on the test, and it was a minor in terms of uh, disagreement between me and him. Like he he think, thought I should have been more towards the parked cars. Uh, you know, maybe I should have split the difference and gone down the middle. Whatever. It was one minor, and um, I passed. Um, other than that, so it was really really good. Um, Road back. Um, lost my instructor on the way back um, it's in traffic so I got to ride back basically part of the way on my own which felt amazing because then I felt like I was riding my own bike really but obviously wasn't um, but it was only for like half a mile until he caught me back up again anyway so but yeah anyway nice little bit of freedom on the way home um, got home I already had a new bike which I think I'd hinted at in some of the other videos I'd had the bike since the January of 2021 so i'd bought that in the new year just as we'd gone into lockdown actually it was the weekend before we went into lockdown so bought that uh, it'd been sat there i'd been meticulously making sure that the battery was kept on a trickle charger and that it was clean and that it, it was covered up and all that sort of stuff got home uh switched my insurance over to my new bike um and it was fantastic so I will put a picture of my new bike on the screen now. So here it is. And that new bike was a Kawasaki ER6F. Uh, it's a 2016 model with ABS. Uh, it was immaculate condition. Uh, it had done 3,000 miles from new, full service history, all the keys, 
uh, really, really immaculate conditioner all round. Uh, and I paid for that in January 2020, 4,295 pounds, which was probably on the upper end of the price for those bikes, but it did have ABS. So that's that was sort of commanding about a 500 pound premium. And uh, it was immaculate. Like when I say immaculate, I mean it was mint. Like there wasn't a mark on it. There was no marks on the swing arm, no chips on the wheels. Uh, the paintwork was all nice. Uh, it had never been dropped by the looks of it. So all that sort of stuff, like considering it's like a run of the mill beginner bike, um, in terms of big bikes, uh, it was really, really good. Um, and well, I mean, in comparison to the 600cc bandit I was learning on, with which was carbed and uh, had had a hard life, um, this ER6F felt rapid, um, like 67 horsepower, but quite light, parallel twin engine, um, very torquey really good fun like honestly as first bikes go i could recommend this like it, it was a really nice bike the only thing that i think let it down was it was quite vibrating so because it's a twin and it was there was a lot of buzz through the bars even though they were allegedly meant to be better at that age the bars the pegs um after about an hour my feet were starting to go a little bit numb from the vibration so yeah, I mean, that's a common complaint on the uh, the Kawasaki's. Um, it's a bit of a thump, 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 thump noise on the engine, and it does vibrate through the frame and through the the handlebars and stuff. So, yeah, a bit annoying, but to be honest, it was it was fantastic overall. Um, so that was really good, and that was on the Thursday. So I went out for a lovely little ride out on the uh, the Friday evening, and over the weekend I had a little explore. Amazing. Took it gently because obviously it was new, lots of power, very responsive in comparison to the bike I'd learnt on, and uh, yeah, really good fun. Uh, ironically, it cost me £80 a year less to insure that than the YS125. Make of that what you will. Um, so yeah, anyway. Um, commuted to work on it then, on the Monday, the Tuesday, the Wednesday, and on the Thursday. And uh, the Thursday was my last day of work before a half-term break because I work in a school. So I thought, well, I'm not in work on the Friday. Let's go for a nice evening ride. And I went all over the place. I went across from Birmingham, um, and then I went um, out into Bridge North, out into the um, Shropshire Hills, all over the place. It was really good fun. And uh, riding back, um, again, just, I actually, ironically, went on a very, very um, different route to what I normally would, because I was starting to feel a bit tired, so I thought, oh, I'll go a shorter way home. Uh, started going through and uh, and I filled up with fuel because I was running a bit low on fuel the first time I had to fill it up. And um, yeah, I got to a zebra crossing. I stopped and the lady that was driving a Honda Accord behind me came flying around the corner and did not stop. So she rear-ended me pretty hard. Uh, hard enough that I had my rear brake on and I'd stopped just short of a junction. So if you imagine there was a zebra crossing here, uh, there was a road on this side road, I left a gap, and I was the first car the other side of the gap. So there was a nice big gap in front of me um, and I'd let the car pull out because there was a queue in front of me. So I'd let the car pull across, that car had gone across and then the uh, car behind me, uh, the Honda Accord, just slammed into the back of me. Uh, I had my foot on the rear brake and it was in gear as well. And I was looking at my mirrors like I've been taught. So I was doing the whole uh, looking in my mirrors to make sure that, you know, I wasn't gonna get rear-ended ironically. And uh, by the time I'd seen her in my mirrors, uh, she had smashed into me. Like the the noise is, is terrible. Like it was terrible. And um, yeah, it was quite scary to be honest. Like she, she hit me so hard that my bike was wedged in her car. Um, and uh, she was about two inches from my feet with the front of her car uh, on the pegs. So I was really, really lucky that she didn't hit my feet or my legs. Um, I stayed on the bike, but only because I rammed the brakes on as hard as I could, because I knew I was gonna be pushed towards the car in front of me. Uh, so I immediately stalled the bike to try and give it extra stopping power, basically. And um, yeah, she rammed me about eight foot 
so um, significant. I'm pretty certain she was on her phone, to be honest. Like, to not see a bright green bike with a top box, with a rider wearing a fluorescent jacket in good light conditions uh, outside of school, that's pretty poor. So, um, yeah. Anyway, it didn't come off, amazingly. Um, you'll see from the photo that I put up in a second, she was so far over my back wheel that I could get off the bike and the bike did not fall over. Um, so I'll put that clip here. So as you can see, uh, my bike is substantially wedged under her car. And those of you, I know a few of you um, follow um, Reddit on the Moto UK one, and quite a lot of you will have seen that photo that I posted um, on, um, on the Reddit forum. And uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of people were just like, how the hell did she manage to do that? But anyway, uh, she was initially apologetic and then turned very defensive. Um, and very sort of uh, upset. She was obviously in shock, same as I was, but um, yeah. Uh, to be fair, she, uh, you know, initially was a bit confused and stuff like that, but um, her husband turned up and he exchanged details and the police did turn up because the road was blocked because I couldn't actually get her car or my bike out of her car. So um, her recovery vehicle came and basically drove the car off my bike. It was quite apparent, and I'll put a few little... Um, uh, photos hopefully in here now that you can see that uh, my bike had some significant damage so the uh, the, the seat had basically tilted up a bit uh, the frame so it had, it had sort of done this and that meant that the rear seat wouldn't open anymore uh, the rear wheel was tucked so it was it was pushing against the the rear swing arm uh, sort of shape so if that was the wheel and the rear swing arm sort of like wrapped around it was touching um, in there so that was a problem um, I couldn't really spin the wheel very freely the rear um, number plate holder and the indicators and all that sort of stuff that was all smashed up and wrecked so um, there was no damage really from the from the rear pegs the rear sets forwards um, but obviously it had done significant damage to the frame so not to mention that she'd wrecked a tire as well and all sorts of stuff so yeah it was it was in my opinion it was likely to be a write-off um, I certainly wasn't gonna be able to ride it home so waited for recovery that took forever um, yeah so it wasn't good um, I tried to strip the bike as best I could using my toolkit that I got on the bike, which is not just the standard toolkit. I had a little little toolkit as well. Um, my wife came and I managed to strip off like um, the uh, gear indicator for the, the GI Pro and uh, the top box, this thing here. Um, took that off so that's, uh, that wasn't uh, taken away. Because I, I knew that if it was going to be written off, there was a very good likelihood that I wouldn't see it again. and. Um, it would just be sent to a salvage yard and stuff. So I'd then have to try and claim the prices of the stuff back, which was a bit of a pain. So yeah, um, basically it, it was kind of one of those things where I thought, okay, get as much off it as I can. So I did, um, took off whatever I could. And then, uh, yeah, that's when the insurance nightmare really started. So I contacted my insurance company. They advised me that because it was clearly a non-fault claim, I should probably claim off her insurance using their third party claims handling agent. Uh, that claim agent is fourth dimension. I can honestly say I have never worked or had any dealings with such an incompetent company as uh, fourth dimension. Uh, their attitude towards giving you updates was so poor, they did not chase the third party um, for liability in any way, shape or form uh, they were 100% trying to get me to have higher bikes so that they could charge her insurer um, 100 pounds a day ish uh, for higher charges. They were charging storage charges for my bike. Um, and again, the longer that went on, the more money they made. So the whole insurance system is a racket anyway. Like it's all about them trying to make as much money as possible for each other um, and who, how much they can you know rake out of someone for somebody else's misfortune so i didn't have a higher bike i refused one to be honest i was uh, my back and my neck were so sore following the crash anyway uh, i had to have about uh, 12 sessions of physio um i'm good now like i'm okay uh, my neck and my back they all feel good occasionally i get a bit of back pain still but to be honest like that's i think that's part and parcel of like just general old age as well <laughs> older age i should say um but yeah, so 
I got so fed up with that dealing with them that in the end, what I did was I asked them to refer it on to my underwriter, um, which was Marker Study. And I have to say, from when Marker Study took over, it was a much better experience. So if you are experiencing really, really crap customer service from your motorcycle insurer, I would recommend pushing through for a, um, a, 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 a direct dealing with your underwriter. So I was insured through Kawasaki Insurance who are a subsidiary of Bikeshaw, who are un who are brokers basically for Adrian Flux, who underwrite marker study policies. It all sounds really, really ridiculous, but basically this seems to be quite common in motorcycle insurance that you only ever really deal with brokers, not un underwriters. Uh, whereas in car insurance, you're more likely to deal with a, a broker who solely deals with one underwriter and that underwriter is basically the sole provider of policies for that insurer but anyway it, it, it was seems way more complicated for bike insurance i've had car claims in the past and i've never had an issue like i had with this so i don't know what was going on but anyway basically did that and uh yeah i mean to be perfectly honest um once i got them involved that it was really good um within three days they'd valued the bike they'd valued it too low but i basically got a partial payout um so they paid me uh three thousand two hundred pounds I paid £4,300 for the bike um, about five months earlier, but obviously I'd done no mileage on it really. So it was still immaculate. The bikes of similar age and models had actually gone up in price because the used bike market at the moment is really buoyant. So um, I was like, that's nah, not enough. So they reevaluated it and gave me nearly £1,000 more. So basically I think I was about £15 off what I'd paid. So that was fine. Um, it was close enough. Um, and I had put some miles on it and it was another owner, etc., etc. So yeah, uh, that seemed fair enough. Did that um, personal injury claim and all that sort of stuff. Uh, that went through, um, took a bit of time, uh, was gonna go to court, then they settled out of court. I'm not entirely sure how you could argue that it wasn't her fault, but anyway, whatever. They settled, um, not a huge payout, you know, I mean, we're talking small fry really, uh, but it was more the fact I wanted to be compensated for the inconvenience that I'd been put through and um, the pain and suffering that I'd gone through with my back and my neck. Um, so yeah, so they covered the physio costs, uh, they covered the bike payout, they covered the personal injury claim, all that sort of stuff. Um, there is still a bit of an ongoing saga with that because I lost my no claims bonus initially when I claimed off my own policy because I only had one year. Um, so you lose your no claims and it goes down as a fault claim until every cost is recovered and then you have your no claims bonus reinstated and the the, the fault changes from a, a fault claim to a non-fault claim in my case. Um, that is taking longer than I expected. It will happen, I'm sure, and I hope it happens before my renewal um, because otherwise that'll be a pain. But basically, um, because that meant that I had a fault claim and no no claims, it did mean that when I came to get a new policy uh, for a new bike, uh, that limited what I could buy somewhat. So to put it into context, my Kawasaki insurance first time round was about 600 quid. It was about 80 pound less than I paid for the YS actually. So um, quite cheap, relatively speaking, for a new bike, quite powerful for a new rider, all that sort of stuff. Because I had that fault claim and no no claims, to insure the same bike again was gonna cost 1,700 pounds. So there was no way that I was gonna pay that. That was way too much money. Um, so I needed a new, new bike. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought long and hard. I, I really, really liked the Kawasaki, but um, to be honest, it wasn't without its flaws. Like I say, the, the, sort of the vibration and stuff like that. Looked at a load of bikes, went and had a look at something, some older bikes. So I looked at things like a Yamaha uh, FZ6 Phaser. I looked at um, some old uh, BMWs. I looked at some Honda CB, uh, C, CBF 600s, the Hornets and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of them were really old. Like we're talking like 2004. Um, they'd done quite a lot of mileage, that sort of stuff. Anyway, in the end, I kind of settled um, because I knew what I was getting and I thought um, I just want something that's going to be cheap to run, cheap to insure, and parts will be easily available if I do drop it or anything like that. So I went for a 2010 Suzuki Bandit 650 SA, so uh, semi, semi fared ABS, uh, which was a key thing. I wanted a bike of ABS, and a lot of the older ones did not have ABS. So uh, I'm going to put a picture of it on the screen here. It is really 
really nice. It's a 10 plate. Um, it had done uh, 9,000 miles in 10 slash 11 years. Uh, looking through its MOT history, it's had a couple of MOTs where it's had advisories for things like uh, tire depth for tread depth, which is fine. They were obviously replaced because they're still new. Um, thin brake pads, that sort of stuff. But to be honest, nothing major. And it's got a stack of service history, whether that's fluid changes, brake pads, spark plugs, everything. So although it had done low mileage, and what often happens with low mileage bikes sometimes is they're not serviced. So because they haven't done the miles, people just don't service them. This had clearly been serviced every year. It had an oil and filter, valve clearances when they were needed doing. It had had um, uh, all the coolant flushed. It had had all the brake fluid flushed, everything like that. Now, basically, uh, I paid over a thousand pound less than I paid for the for the ninja uh, for the sorry the ER6F. Uh, I paid three thousand pounds for the Bandit, which I suppose for a ten year old bike is quite a lot of money. However, it is immaculate, pretty much. The only thing that I would say shows its age is there's tiny tiny paint flecks that are coming off on the wheels, but other than that, it is mint. Like it has got no marks on the on the paintwork. Uh, the forks are all good. Uh, swing arms beautiful uh, all the engines fine the exhaust is fine um, absolutely brilliant so you can see from the photo that I've put up on the uh, on the screen um, that I took it out for a few rides I took it over to the uh, like Clee Hill is not far from where I live well I say not far it's half an hour 40 minutes but the views were spectacular of the bike and from the top of the hill absolutely amazing um, the only thing I've done to it um, that's that's I've added on really uh, is I've obviously added a trickle charger onto it. So I use my Oxford Ox, uh, Oxide 900 or something. I don't know what it is. I'll put the link in the description. Uh, but basically attach the tails to that so I can just plug it in all the time. And uh, it's got a couple of other add-ons that I didn't buy um, that were already fitted. So it's got, an, uh, uh, I think it's an Innov K2. So it's front and rear dash cam basically, which is great and it works really well. Um, particularly in all right light, it's fine. Night time's crap, but that's to be expected. Um, it's got heated grips. It's got a USB port in the one fairing side thing. Uh, it already had a top box that Suzuki uh, top box that's matched to the uh, ignition key. Uh, all those sorts of things. So yeah, really good. Um, the only thing that I've changed is I've put a new exhaust on because the exhaust that was on it, uh, I'll see if I can find a photo with it on. It was like massive it was like a bazooka it was so big i was struggling to get it through my um my um gate that i have to get the bike through it, it was a nightmare uh, so i changed it to a black widow 350 mil length um end can and link pipe i didn't change the headers because they're stainless headers the collector box so where it goes from four to one notoriously rusts on bandits uh, but mine is fine so at the moment it's absolutely good if it rusts, I'll change the headers and it'll just be a straight through system with no collector. Um, it'll be a four to one. I'll put that on. But at the moment, it's fine. It's under cover. It's uh, rarely ridden in wet weather uh, unless it has to be. So, And if it is, it's is, it's got um, X XCP rust inhibitor on as well. So hopefully that helps uh, as it goes through. So that is my new bike. Now, I really wanted to do a reveal of the new bike with me on it. But the problem is it is so cold at the moment and um, I've had various uh, health problems over the last few weeks that's meant that I haven't really been in a position where I've been felt well enough to ride and um, I would never want to ride if I don't feel 100%. So yeah, um, that's the new bike and um, yeah, it's a beauty. It, it rides really well. I mean, it's terrible on fuel, <laughs> um, but then coming from a 125, pretty much everything is terrible on fuel. So uh, I think I do about 50 to the gallon, which from what I can work out is pretty good for a Bandit 650, especially if you're um, spirited, shall we say. So, you know, nice acceleration, um, all that sort of stuff. It's going to need a couple of new tyres when it comes to its MOT in March, and uh, I'm going to do an oil and filter change on it before the start of the new season as well, but that should cost pennies really, and I'll definitely do that myself, and I'll video it and put a, a how-to on as well. What's next then? Well... Uh, I'm hoping that this year 
is a bit more like normal. I know that we've got a new variant going round and everyone's panicking, but I'm hoping that it's all going to be okay. And uh, I want to be able to go out and do some vlogs, um, even if it is just footage and I voice over and have a quick sort of a chat from back here so that it's really good audio quality for you guys. Um, I'd like to do some tours. So I'd like to go into Wales and I'd like to go up to the peaks and to the lakes and possibly even Scotland, although we'll see how time permits next year because it's looking quite booked up for me already. And uh, long term, uh, once uh, one of my friends, Cameron, pulls his finger out and gets his full license, I would very much like to be able to go over to Europe uh, once everything's settled down a bit and everything's not all crazy. I'd like to go through and, uh, and ride through from, um, from France and then down into Spain and that sort of stuff as well. So that'd be amazing. I'd like to be able to make my way down and, and get to the south coast of France and stuff like that potentially. So that'd be really, really nice uh, long term, but um, we'll see how we get on. Um, I'm going to need a massive, massive bank account for the fuel bill for that, I assume. So, but yeah, we'll see how we get on. So lots more to come. Um, as ever, you can expect quite a few uh, videos to come for general maintenance and how to's on the on the bandit and stuff like that I've seen a few videos on whether they're good first bikes um, and They're generally pretty good videos um, But I, I think I'll put my own take on one as well once I've ridden it for about a year. So that'll be in about July um, I'll, I'll have had a good idea as to The good and the bad what I like what I don't like um, I've done quite a few thousand miles on it already um, so since I've had it, I've, I've been keen to get on it a lot where I can. So it's only because uh, riding to work in icy conditions is not is not fun. But anything that's not icy, really, I, I will go out on it. Um, you know, if if I feel like it. So uh, I think since July, I've put about four thousand miles on it. So I've done a decent chunk of mileage on it already. Um, yeah. So feeling really really happy with it. Um, I can't see me wanting to change it at the moment. Uh, the insurance. Uh, for context as well once all this insurance claim business is sorted out and I get a year's no claims back on and then at the end of this year it'll be two years no claims and no fault claims um, that will make a massive difference because I will at that point be probably looking fully comp maybe 280 quid a year uh, that's good value like even a CB 500 was looking a lot more expensive than that so yeah um, stay tuned I hope it's been nice to uh, to have a little catch up with me and uh, I really do appreciate all the support. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe as always and until next time, take it easy. Mm -hmm.